Praise the Lord. Malachi chapter 2, verse 15. The title of the message today is The Godly Seed. The Godly Seed. And we shall read from Malachi chapter 2, verse 15. And did not he make one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit. And we are for one that he might seek a godly seed. Therefore, take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. God seeks a godly seed. The first thing we shall do today the first thing we shall do today, I'm going to share with us a short video clip. A short video clip of about 2 minutes, 22 seconds or so. But I want us to listen to it very carefully because it will form the basis of what we are going to be sharing today. Interestingly, it is a Muslim speaking in the mosque. And the Muslim says something that should concern every Christian, every believer who thinks like Jesus, who wants to fulfill the purpose of God. If you look on your screen now, you will see the picture of the Muslim standing at the podium in a mosque. Uh, the video is specifically 2 minutes 31 seconds. I want us to listen to it. If you cannot see the video, don't worry. Just listen to what the man is saying. And then we shall continue with the message. A lot of Christians are leaving their faith, especially the young generation. The churches are emptying out. The Pew Research Center has shown that in the last 10 years, 28% of People have left the church and became atheists or agnostic. They're not anymore impressed by the dogma that someone 2,000 years ago was crucified for their sins. They're searching for something that's more meaningful, that's consistent with science, and consistent with the principles that we know today. Islam is the answer for them. And we are jumping on the opportunities that as these churches empty out, instead of spending larger amounts of money to build our masjids, we are buying these churches. We bought three churches so far, converted them to masjids, and now we have one we are buying with a school to make it, because we have to serve the same people. The people who were Part of that community, one day they will be Muslims. So we'll make it into a masjid and an Islamic school for our children and their children, inshallah. hundred years ago, they invaded the Muslim world and they built missionary schools and destroyed Islamic schools and masjids. Today, we bring the favor back, turn their churches into masjids and their schools into Islamic schools, bring the light of Islam to here. We're able to buy ready to go institutions that have been there for a long time, but they emptied out. And now it is time to be filled with Muslims, with reverts, converts. This is an election year, but we're not going to be happy with either candidate. We have to be happy when Islam 
becomes the best candidate for us. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give Islam the victory in this country, in our hearts, in our families, in our nation. I hope we all heard that. The man started by saying a lot of Christians are leaving their faith, especially the young generation. And he repeated, and he repeated, the churches are emptying out, particularly the young generation. Did the man tell a lie? No. He spoke the truth. The church is emptying out, particularly the young generation. What we want to find out this morning is why. How come the current generation of Christian children, Christian youths, are not interested in the faith of their parents? Many of them bear Christian names, but their lifestyle, their character, they are worse than demons. And they are from Christian homes. Some time ago, I shared that the top pornographic actress in Nigeria is a Christian. In fact, her stage name, when translated to English, is My Christian Mother. Her stage name in the pornographic industry. The second girl, the next to her, is also a Christian. Her name is Precious. The third one is also a Christian. <clears throat> and you can continue, where well, if you enter into the drugs arena, you enter into cultism arena, you enter into drinks, alcoholism, the common one now, prostitution, they call it hookup. Christians, what went wrong? Malachi chapter 2 verse 15 that we read. The Bible says God joined a man and a woman together. Because God is looking for a godly seed. Every marriage has twofold objectives. Every marriage. When a man and a woman and they come together to form a family, there are two objectives. Number one is fellowship for the man and the woman. Fellowship and help meet. The woman helps the man. The woman, the man upholds his wife. The two of them fellowship. That is one objective. The second objective of the marriage is to produce godly seed for the Almighty God. You see, everything that God wants to do on planet Earth, God requires a raw material. Every evil that Satan wants to do to counter the purpose of God, Satan requires a raw material. Every child that is born is that raw material. That child can either be used by God or he will be used by Satan. But definitely one of them will use that child. 
The way the child is processed is what will determine who is going to use him, whether God or Satan. We have a generation of parents that did not process children to become godly seeds. And unfortunately, many of those parents are ministers of the gospel, intercessors, evangelists, missionaries, church workers, prophets, prophetess. Many of them are Christian professionals, professors, doctors, lawyers, engineers, architects. Men and women in whose life God made considerable investment, expecting them to deliver godly seed. God is not expecting you to deliver millions, to deliver estate, to deliver houses, to deliver exotic vehicles. God gave you a home. God gave you a marriage because God wants godly seed. A godly seed that can be useful for Jesus Christ. Every attack of Satan on marriage is an indirect attack on the children. The main target of Satan's attacks on marriages is the children. The moment the marriage begins to collapse, the moment husband and wife are no longer in harmony, the children become the victim. And when the children become the victim, they are turned in between, they become raw materials being processed for Lucifer. We look at the trend in the world today. Some of the statistics that I'm going to be sharing with us came out a few years ago. They may no longer be 100% accurate. Accurate in the sense that the situation has gotten worse. It has not gotten better. So that if I tell you that uh, 10% of children were doing something according to these statistics, which was a few years ago, you can be sure that as of today, the figure has risen to at least 15%, if not double. But it did not get better. It got worse. In fact, it has gotten to a point that the generation now is referred to as Gen Z, Generation Z. And they have their own peculiar way of doing things. They focus only on entertainment and sensuality. They are, as a group, rebellious and self-willed. A generation that does not receive instruction. A generation that does not listen to parents. A generation that believes it knows it all. A generation that is sensuous. Now, in U.S., for example, because they keep records very well, we don't know what the figure is in Nigeria, but the one that we have in Nigeria we can share. Divorce rate is over 60% in the U.S., which is a way of saying if 10 marriages were conducted in a month, there is certainty that at least six of them Six of those marriages will end up in divorce. Every 10 seconds, a teenager becomes a drug addict. Please consider that, teenager. 10 seconds. 10 seconds. More than 60% of high school students have smoked 
cannabis, Indian hemp, more than 60%. 70% of those who smoke hemp, cannabis, for three years will go on to heroin. Every 45 seconds, another teenage girl becomes pregnant. 45 seconds. Why most of them do not give birth is because of the next statistic, they commit abortion. One million teenage abortion annually. One million. If you look at some at the situation in Nigeria today, these statistics are easily replicated to the situation in Nigeria. Now, why is this so? What happened? Were the children born bad? Were the children born rebellious? Were the children created by God to be lawless, to be perverse? The answer is no. The answer is simply parents have neglected, they have ignored the manual, the operating manual of the creator. When you go to buy an electronic device, or even a mechanical device. It comes with what is called owner's manual. You are meant to refer to the owner's manual in operating that device or that appliance. And the manufacturer will tell you, make sure you go through this manual before you operate that device. The manual that God provided for bringing up children is the Bible. Very few Christian parents refer to the Bible. Very few Christian parents apply biblical worldview in bringing up their children. Many of us Christians have become secularized in our perspective, in our worldview. So we apply that secular perspective to bringing up children. And the children, if a child is brought up with a secular worldview, the child will grow up secularized. They will have nothing to do with God. Even though you take him to church, he is accompanying you because he has no choice. When he has a choice, he will not go. And that is why the churches are emptying out, as that Muslim said whose video we watched at the beginning. Now let's first identify the key problem area. And then we move into the Bible, into what the Bible says. One problem that parents have to correct, particularly young couples, who are just getting married and couples that are just building families is they must know the spelling of parental love. The love of a parent. If we ask you, can you spell parental love? Many people will go P-A-R-E-N-T-A-L-L-O-V-E, -E, parental love. The answer is zero. That is not the spelling. Parental love is spelled T-I-M-E, time. T-I-M-E, time. The first responsibility of the parent is to make sure you spend time with your child. 
time. If you cannot devote quality time for your child, Satan will train that child for you. And at the end, we will see it in the scriptures. It is the parent that we cry. Some delegate parental responsibility to their housemaid. Some delegate parental responsibility to the schools. Some delegate parental responsibility to crutch. <laughs> I'm not saying you are not going to work. Of course, there are bills to be paid. But you must make adequate time. In between your work, in between your career. Because the school can only impart education and knowledge to your child. No school can teach your child character. Children are taught character from home. It is from home. A school cannot perform that responsibility for you. There is no school that will do that. Some people will send their children to very expensive schools, put them in boarding house, and say, yes, we've sent them to very good school. They will come out well. It is in that school that they become demons. Character is imparted by parents. It is your responsibility to impart your values and your virtues to your child. To let your child know what you stand for. To let your child know what this family stands for. To let your child know the God that you serve. To let your child know what you do not approve. You cannot delegate that responsibility to your housemaid. Or to your school teacher. Nowadays, in Europe... In America, the school teacher will teach your child LGBTQ and how your child should become a transgender. Let's look at how parents, statistically again, how fathers, for example, and that is quite critical, how fathers treat their children in a lifetime. The average father spends 40 hours to work. 40 in a week. He spends 50 hours to sleep in a week. He spends 7 hours to dress, to groom himself. He will go to the bathroom, he will shave, he will put on his suit, he will put on his face cream, his body cream, put on his perfume. He will spend a total of seven hours in a week to groom himself. In that week, statistically, he spends 24 and a half minutes to talk to his son. Now look at it again. 40 hours to work, 50 hours to sleep, 7 hours to dress, 24 and a half minutes to talk to his son, to converse with his son in one week, statistically. So in his lifetime, an average father will spend 25 years sleeping, 12 years of his life working, 3 years of his life grooming himself, 11 days and 16 hours talking to his son, not even up to one month. Not even up to two weeks 
in his lifetime. And then, when the child becomes a drug addict, he begins to wonder, what went wrong? I gave him the best education. I sent him to the best school. I gave him everything he wanted. How could you do this? How could he do what? Why wouldn't he do it? And when the daughter becomes a prostitute, the daughter becomes a pornographic actress, the daughter starts doing hookup, and the father discovers. And he goes, how can you do that? You went to the best of the best schools. Everything you needed, you had. Why could you do this? Why wouldn't she do it? Who was bringing her up? Some parents have handed over their children to television. It is TV that the child will talk to from sun up till sundown. Now, some have handed with the advent of mobile phone. They, in fact, they just bought the child a mobile phone of his own so that let him go and sort himself out with the mobile phone. And the mobile phone is a major gateway to the internet. And the internet, you know what is there. We don't need to talk about it. Now we are talking about Christians. And we are looking at how come the churches are emptying out. How come we don't have youths who are interested in the things of God? Youths who do not have godly values. As we are saying this thing today, it should concern us that the next generation of Christians are not committed. They are not committed to Christianity. They are not committed to holiness. They are not committed to sanctification. And we shouldn't talk about soul winning. Even their own soul need to be saved. So are they going to save souls? The situation is so bad. Brethren, if you are a parent here, or you are going to be a parent, you, you need to take this thing seriously and watch your child. How many Christian parents today can say affirmatively and truthfully that my daughter is 18 years old, and my daughter is still a virgin. Christian. In fact, how many pastors can say it? How many evangelists can say it? How many intercessors can say it? That my son is 20 years old. And my son is still a virgin. Or my daughter is 20 years old. My daughter, no man has touched her. No man has seen her nakedness. How many Christian parents can say that? Not to talk of, my son is 20 years old. He has never touched alcohol in his life. He has never smoked cigarette. He is not perverted. He doesn't use drugs. Can you say it? We are hearing some disturbing cases now of some youths assaulting their father and killing their father in a brutal way. There was one, a pastor, his son killed him on a Christian camp and cut his father to pieces. He was going to dispose of the remains of his father, cut in pieces, in a carton, when he was challenged and it was discovered that the boy, 21 years old, cut his father into pieces. The father was a pastor. They were on a Christian campground. 
There was another one that switched on the generator so that the generator would make noise. And he assaulted his father with cutlass and hacked his father to death. Terrible things are going on because as of the time that the child should have been brought up properly, the parents were pursuing money. They were pursuing career. Or they had allowed Satan to break into their ranks. The parents had separated. And the child did not have balanced upbringing because the mother has a role to play in the life of the child. The father has a role to play in the life of the child. Both of them must be together. That is why every Christian parent must do everything possible to avoid divorce or separation. The husband must love and the wife must submit for the sake of the children or else they will end up with demons in their hands a few years down the line. Now, how did the situation go wrong? How did it become so bad? It can be traced back to the teachings of a psychologist in the United States of America in the 60s. The man's name <clears throat> was Benjamin Spock, Dr. Benjamin Spock. You can Google it. You will find his name. You will find his picture. You will see him. It's on the internet. Spock is spelled C-P-O-C-K. Sorry, S-P-O-C-K. Thank you. It's Spock. S-P-O-C-K. Dr. Benjamin Spock. He came out with a teaching then that when a child is growing up, don't beat him. Don't flog him. Allow him to express. And he used a lot of psychology terms. Attitude, cognitive, behavior, and so on and so forth. That if you beat a child, if you spank a child, if you correct a child, you will hinder him from expressing his personality, from developing the way he ought to develop, how to form his character. So, a generation of parents followed that an expert in psychology, in child behavioral studies, has said. And from America, it got to Europe. And it spread all over Europe. And of course, whatever reaches Britain, you know that with the next flight, it's in Nigeria. So it got to Nigeria too. And a generation of parents. Some people are still doing it till today. There are parents who tell you they don't beat their child. That they reason with him. You reason with who? He said, once you explain things to my child, you see, my child is very understanding. Well, once you explain things to him, he will ask you questions. Even if he does something, I, I will just sit him down and I will explain to him that what you have done is not, and the junior will not decide. I said, do you understand? He said, yes, mommy. Yes, mommy. He said, good boy. Ha. <laughs> hey. Fire is under your roof. Fire. Inferno has entered your house. You say you understand. Anyway, let's continue. When we get to the Bible, we will look at that again. Whether the child understands or not, we will hear what the manufacturer has to say about that product that is in your hand. Twenty years later, the same Dr. Benjamin Spock 
turned around, released another paper. And this time around, he writes, when your child does anything silly, anything stupid, get a stick, get a cane, and flog him. The same man. By the 80s, his teaching has changed. The man who said, don't beat children in the 60s. In the 80s, the same man is saying, beat them. By that time, it was too late. It was too late. The hippie culture had arrived. The sex explosion has arrived. The gang wars had started. Cultism had started. Teenage pregnancy had started. By the time Dr. Benjamin Spock saw a generation of adults who do not fear God, who do not obey their parents, have no regard for rule of law, by the time he made the turn around, it was too late. It was too late. Most parents don't listen again. In fact, it has now become a state policy in some countries. You must not beat your child. Which is in alignment with the 10-point agenda of Alice Bailey. That parental authority over the children must be removed. Children Parents must be stopped from exercising authority over their children. Brethren, if you are a psychedelic Christian, if you are a civilized, in quote, civilized Christians, Christian, if you are an enlightened Christian, and you believe that a child should not be flogged, you are breeding a monster under your roof. That monster will consume you. When that monster grows, it will feed on you. Because you cannot be wiser than God. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 15. What does the manufacturer say? Proverbs chapter 22, verse 15. God is the manufacturer. The Bible is his manual. And concerning his product, which is a child, the manufacturer says in Proverbs 22, 15, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. God didn't say smartness. He didn't write intelligence. He didn't write cleverness. He says foolishness. Say so that to your child. If you open up his heart, there is only one thing you will find there. Foolishness. Say so only one thing will remove it from him. Only one thing. Correction of a road. A cane. God did not say foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. The love of a mother will drive it far from him. Or the gentleness of the father will drive it far from him. The care of the parents will drive it far from him. God says the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. And you know the interesting thing? I still checked this last night on the internet to find out some facts about this message. I went to search again. At what age does a child begin to form character? His personality. At what age? And I still saw it last night. Between the ages of three to five. Three 
to five. A child's character is formed before the child is seven years old. What the child does subsequently is that he now builds on it. He now begins to concretize it. But the basic formation is done between the ages of three and five. So if you don't mold the child at that tender age, then the child will have formed his personality for life. For life. When he is now in his teenage years, when he's not able to assert himself, he now begins to bring it out. That's when you now begin to complain, what's wrong with Junior? What's wrong with him? Ah, what was wrong with him was wrong when he was three years old. You didn't notice. He was showing you when he was four years old that you should correct it. You didn't do anything. It began to be concretized when he was five years, six years. You didn't pay attention. He is now 16 years old, 18 years old. You are now asking, Pastor, I, I want you to help me talk to my son. I don't know what has come over him. Ah, it came over him when, it was, when he was three years old. Look, Proverbs chapter 20 verse 11. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 11. Let's read it. Even a child is known by his doings, whether his work be pure and whether, whether it be right. Even a child, you know by what he's doing, whether this child is pure whether this child is going to be right, you will know it. At the age of three, he will start showing you. All those little, little things. You don't ignore it. Look, by the grace of God, I'm a father. And I have children. <clears throat> When we gave birth to our first son, I learned something. As the child began to crawl, and as he began to walk as a toddler, I discovered that the child does not fear me, and he does not fear his mother. The only person that the child fears is the cane that is in the house. The cane. That's the only person that he feared. That's the only thing that he feared. The cane. Now, some parents will say, I cannot beat my child. And God is saying, apply the rod of correction. God is not advocating wicked punishment. God is not saying, at, a, at the slightest provocation, just take a stick and start whacking the young guy. That's not what God is saying. God is not advocating wicked punishment. What God is avoiding is wicked love. It is wicked love when a parent says, I cannot beat my child. It is love. She's showing love, all right. The father is showing love, all right. 
but it is wicked love. Without being wicked, but by being firm, we apply the cane to our children whenever it was necessary. Because this teaching that I'm doing now, interestingly, I did this teaching for the first time in 1993. I still saw it in my notes. And everything that I said in 1993 is still relevant up till today. So before I got married, before I started having children, I had already known by the word of God, God's standard for parental child care according to God's standard. Any child that is not brought up with discipline, firm, loving discipline, that child is going to bring sorrow to the parents. Because Satan will bring up that child. And Satan has devised many ways of doing it. Many ways. And he will do it and do it well. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Ah. I'm not even looking at the clock. I will have to stop here. After this Proverbs 22, verse 6. We will continue next week, Sunday. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Simple English. Which way do you want your child to go? Now notice that God did not say, teach a child in the way he should go. God says, train. There's a difference between training and teaching. In the schools, they teach. In army barracks, they train. They don't teach soldiers in the barracks. They train them. That is why a young man who is afraid of a fight, a young man who, if you should slap his face, he's going to, he, he, his arms will drop and he will, slunk away, he will slink away. Put that same child in the army, that young man. And they will train him. After they have trained him, if they burn you well, go and raise your, even, don't even raise your hand, just raise your voice against him. And you will see what he will do. The same person. That same young man, they will put a rifle in his hand and they will tell him go. And with a rifle, he will go and face a tank. And he will not turn back. He will face a tank. They will tell him go. And in front of him there is bazooka. There is grenade propeller. There is machine gun. And he will not turn back. And he will go. Why? He has been trained. What the Muslims do, they don't teach their children. They train them. They train them to follow Every error that they are teaching. And that young man grows up, he would rather die defending that teaching. But Christians, oh, we believe that we are civilized. A lot of Christians believe that they have love. That is why even in the church, you cannot discipline people. Even in the church, you cannot correct people. In, the next thing is, they start forming cliques. They start forming groups. And they start resisting that correction. Even in the church. Because they were not brought up with discipline. 
So when they see a pastor trying to enforce discipline, they can't take it. It's not part of them. And you can't give what you don't have. If you are not disciplined, you can't discipline your child. So if you are brought up without discipline, you have a serious problem in your heart. Because you must first learn how to discipline yourself before you can discipline your child. And the children are very perceptive. The children know. You know, children learn by observing. So when you even teach them Christianity, and your children, they look at you, they know you are pretending. They won't take your God seriously. They know it's a joke. Even though you take your child to church, your child, before listening to what they tell him in Sunday school, the, your child is watching your behavior at home. And from your behavior, he will compare it with what they tell him in the Sunday school. And your child knows that daddy and mommy, they are hypocrites. They are pretending. So there is nothing you tell them about Christianity that they will take seriously. So first and foremost, you need to become a Christian. Before you can say you want to train up your child in the way he should go. Brethren, very few parents can leave their child and they will not worry about what he's doing. Very few parents have that confidence because they too, they know that they didn't train the child. We're having a serious challenge in the church. A non-believer stood in a mosque and spoke the bitter truth to us. That was why we started with that video. And he said the churches are emptying out. Nobody is in their church buildings anymore. So we are buying the churches. And he said we've bought three already. We are making arrangements to buy the fourth one. The fourth one even comes with a school. We will buy the church building. We will buy the school. And then we will use the school now to produce Muslims. Brethren, this generation of Christians, if one should say shame on us, the fellow is not abusing us. He's not telling a lie. If heaven should look now on us and say, shame on you, God is telling us the truth. It is time to make the necessary corrections. You must begin to train up your child. Every parent that has a child, you must make sure you have a daily devotion with the child. Sit your child on your lap. Read the Bible to your child. Explain the Bible to your child. Tell your child what is right from what is wrong. And the day your child does what is wrong, before you tell him, give him a little spanking in his bum and tell him you must not do that. And then you can now explain why he must not do that. Teach your child and convert your child. That's what we are going to be talking about next week, Sunday. There, there is no time today. We need to explain that. That you must win the soul of your child for Christ before your child is five years old. Your child must be converted in your house, not in the Sunday school. Not in the Sunday school. Not in the church. Not in the school. You must sit your child on your lap, explain Jesus Christ to your child, get your child to accept Jesus. Once you get him converted at that age, he is converted for life. We will look at that next week Sunday by the grace of God and look at examples of mighty men of God that God used. They were converted as children. Train up a child in the way that he should go. May the Lord help us in this generation. And for those who have failed, whose children have become monsters, 
May the Lord have mercy upon you and send you deliverance. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We shall stop here for today because of time. I know I have overshot time. I don't even know how many minutes I've spent now. But I know I have overshot time. May the Lord have mercy upon us. And let us hurry now to get the youths back. The churches will not empty out in our generation. In the mighty name of Jesus. Let's bow our heads in prayer. We shall continue next week Sunday. Thank you for listening to this message. God bless you. We encourage you to share the message with your contacts, particularly with the youths. We need to accelerate discipleship among the youths. If you are free, we invite you to join our online worship service on Zoom. The meeting ID is under the message on our YouTube channel. Simply click on More to access the Zoom ID. You may also wish to listen to the message titled, What Does It Mean to Be Born Again? Please scroll towards the bottom of the channel to locate the message. In addition, we recommend the series on foundational doctrines. These are messages crucial to a successful Christian life. Our YouTube channel is houseofcarries.net forward slash audio. Houseofcarries.net forward slash audio. The carries is K. Thank you and God bless you.